Thank you so much for tuning in to today's video. If you're new here, welcome. And if you have been here before, then um, I do apologize for being away for a lot longer than I said I would be. My schedule kind of ended up snowballing and things started to pile up and I just haven't had the time to sit down and make a proper video until now. So yay! So the painting that I have here today is the piece Bedtime Story. I'll be talking a little bit about the process and the frustration that I had, the many frustrations that I had working on this piece. And at the end, I have some good news to share with you guys. So please stay tuned for that. I can already tell today's video is gonna be a little bit on the long side, which I'm sure you guys won't mind since I've been gone for so long. I will allow myself to be a little chatty on today's video. I hope you guys enjoy. So this piece, for the majority of the painting process, it was a real challenge for me. Um, it's, first of all, it started off on the wrong foot because I bought this new Arches watercolor block for it um, that's much bigger than the one I have. It's, uh, I think it's 12 by 15, no. Oh, it's a lot smaller than I thought. It's 10 by 14 inches. And the, the biggest one I had previously was 9 by 12. And because I knew that there was a lot of, there's a lot of detail in the piece, there are a lot of characters, and I just didn't want everything to be so small. So I wanted to draw it on a much bigger piece of a watercolor paper. And I had never painted this big before. So that's added challenge number one. And this watercolor uh, block that I bought, I bought online and then when it was delivered to me, it had a little bent corner that annoyed me, but I, I figured it'd be fine once I take the paper off the block once I was done with the painting and I can just bend it back once the paper is off the block and it will be straightened out. But when I was stretching the paper out before I started painting, which means you just kind of soak the sheet of paper in water, let it dry, and it's supposed to kind of help not um, buckle as you paint because it, it's pre-stretching the paper by soaking in water. When I was doing that, the paper, the, the corner that was bent kind of started lifting and um, separating itself from the block, which totally just like defeats the purpose of having a block that's not supposed to happen. The purpose of having a block in the first place is, you know, you have the convenience of not having to tape anything down. You don't have to cut anything to size. It's already cut uh, for you. And because the edges of the paper are um, gummed along the sides and secured onto the block, it keeps the paper from buckling too much while you paint. So basically, as soon as I started applying water onto this block, the paper started lifting off from the gumming. So I had to basically just take the sheet of paper off the block, which again, totally defeats the purpose of having a block in the first place. I'm just annoyed because it was very expensive and it doesn't do what I needed to do. And I just worry that every, sheet of paper will just lift from the block because of this one bent corner. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> but that was one of the frustrations I had going into this piece. You'll see as I'm painting this that the paper does buckle very heavily. I do have a method of remedying that. I don't show it in the video because I didn't, I didn't take a video of it, but what you do, you turn the paper um, around and then you kind of paint the back side of the sheet with just water and as it dries the buckling does straighten itself out and it's a lot better to work with but I, I did find that I had to do it a couple of times because as I started painting again on the front side, the buckling started to come back. So I, I did have to um, paint the back with just plain water a couple of times for it to be straightened out. I wouldn't recommend that method if you're using watercolor paper that is not uh, the highest of quality and is not 100% cotton. I don't know if the water will seep through to the front. Mine certainly didn't. Um, 
because it's Arsh's and it's, it's 100% cotton. It's quite thick as well. So I would recommend this method to um, unbuckle your watercolor paper, but only if the paper is 100% cotton and is thicker than 140 pounds. The other challenging part of this painting was the colors. I wasn't quite sure what kind of colors I was gonna go with this piece. In my head, I had envisioned it as a very lavender, um, pastel -y kind of color scheme, but for some reason, I just couldn't paint it that way. Um, I did one or two color comps, and I wasn't happy with them, but um, I, <laughs> this was probably a mistake. I just kind of went with it and I said, well, I will just avoid what I did in the color comp, which was, um, that I didn't like, which was to use, uh, or not orange, but like mix yellow with the pink that I was using. And it was creating a lot of oranges that I didn't want because in my head I was picturing a very lavender, um, purpley piece. So I found the oranges to be too warm and it didn't look like how I envisioned the piece. So I made a mental note to myself to really be careful with bringing in any yellows to this piece because I was predominantly using this pink color that I have. And you know what happens when you mix like a cool red and yellow, you get orange. And nothing against orange, I just, I guess, imagined a very kind of cool toned piece with hints of warmth, not the other way around. But unfortunately, when I was doing the color comps, I just could not pull it off and I got frustrated and I just went ahead with the painting, which I know I shouldn't do, but sometimes you just gotta take a leap of faith and trust your abilities and hope that you will be able to pull it off. But I, I do ad admit that it was part of the uh, frustration I had with this piece, which is not knowing how I'm gonna mix all my colors. I also had a very, very vague idea of how I wanted the lighting to be, which also set me off on the wrong foot and it was really challenging to kind of discover that throughout the painting instead of, you know, knowing going into it what you want the lighting to look like. That would have been helpful, but I guess I was really impatient in the planning process of this piece. Thinking back to it now, I do remember spending forever on the drawing and the composition of all the elements. And I was probably just really sick of planning by that point, hence why I rushed the color and the uh, figuring out the lighting stage. I think a part of me is afraid to invest so much time into a piece where I am not 100% sure if I will even like at the end. It's something I struggle with um, to this day, uh, months after. Um, I don't know if I should dedicate so much time into the planning process to ensure that I will have a painting at the end of the day that I will like, or if I should be more spontaneous and just trust that my, you know, instincts will come through when working on the piece and it will become something good and maybe even better than I had envisioned because it will allow more spontaneity as opposed to planning out every single uh, line and color. A part of me really hates planning all that out because I find it really tedious and it really takes the fun out of painting sometimes. But on the flip side, without the planning, like I probably won't even start the painting because I will be so scared off by the blank sheet of paper that I will probably just never start the painting to begin with. So it's a love and hate relationship for sure. I wish I didn't have to spell everything out to the T but I know myself in that I am definitely not spontaneous enough and not brave enough to be able to just invent on the spot 
in my ideal world, I think I would love to be able to be so spontaneous and be able to improvise and at the end of the day be able to create a beautiful picture. That's something I'm slowly working on um, to be more spontaneous and less beholden to a plan. But in the case of this painting, I should have planned it a little bit further because not knowing how I was going to mix the colors that I had envisioned in my head, like I said, I wanted it to be a very lavendery piece. It made me overly cautious of the strokes I was applying. As you'll notice, I just apply very, very thin washes of paint over and over again because I'm just not sure what color it's gonna be and I'm also not sure of the lighting so I'm just applying in very very thin light washes over and over again just slowly nudging things in one direction and then if I don't like it I nudge it the other way and by nudging it I mean slightly darkening the value or nudging it into a color hue like making it a little bit cooler, making it a little bit warmer. That's what's great about painting in very thin layers. Um, I didn't know that this was a style of mine until uh, Joy San on YouTube here pointed that out. She described my painting style as a very kind of layered style and I didn't even realize that there was a word to describe the type of painting style that I typically use. Looking at her working method and mine, we paint in completely different ways. I feel like Joy, when she mixes her colors, she knows what color she's putting down because it is like very close to the color that she's going for. It's like 90% there or 100% there and she does it in like one stroke or one application. Whereas I do like 10 washes to get to the final color that I want. And honestly, if I could mix the exact color right off the bat, I would just do that. But the only uh, reason why I do layer so much is because I just don't know what I need. And so I'm just always nudging things as I go. And what ends up happening is I end up a lot of the times over rendering an area I didn't want to over render because of the amount of applications that it received when it could have just been a clean like one smooth application and what also ends up happening unfortunately is kill some of that uh, initial kind of feathering or I don't know how to describe it, but you know how watercolor, the edges dry in a very distinctive watercolory way? I end up killing a lot of that because I do go over my, I do go over the same area over and over again, which ends up just washing over the beautiful initial edges that the watercolor um, just leaves. So that's what I feel like I ended up doing in this piece. I had to go over the same area over and over again with water and paint just slightly tweaking it as I go and in turn I mean I did achieve the effect I was going for but at the same time I felt like a lot of the initial watercolory effects in the piece had been like washed away and the painting eventually became so dense that once I was done um, I had people ask me if this was digital and I know that they don't mean it in a negative way but I know that it's because I render it so much uh, so it ends up not looking like watercolor. I feel like quite a few of my watercolor pieces have that kind of quality where it doesn't quite look like watercolor because it, the rendering is so tight and those beautifully imperfect artifacts of watercolor and how it, it dries those things are not left in as much because I, I just end up going over it over and over again. I'm hoping that as I go along, I will become more confident in my choices and 
in my knowledge of the medium so that I will be able to just apply a few strokes as needed to get to the statement that I want and in doing so, I will be able to retain what is so beautiful and unique about watercolor. I realize that I'm beginning to sound very negative and like I'm poo-pooing on this piece. It's not that I don't like this piece. I, I like how this piece turned out in the end, but the process was very frustrating. And I feel like it was in an ugly stage for so long. And it also took, I think until honestly, I started putting in the bubbles, it didn't look like it was even an underwater piece. And that's my fault because I think it hinges on the lighting because underwater scenes typically have lighting that's coming from up top. And I wanted to kind of try something different, but I realized I didn't know a different way to make it look underwater without doing the top-down lighting so i just ended up doing the top-down lighting and i think it worked out i wish i had been able to come up with a more unique solution but sometimes you gotta go with what you know and what you know may not be so bad <laughs> i think why this piece stayed in the ugly stage for so long was because it took a while for all the characters to kind of come through I wanted the figures to be very affected by the atmosphere of the water so that means I didn't want them to really pop out too much because I wanted the um, girl and the clamshell bed to be the number one focus of the piece so all the other um, sea creatures had to be kind of less defined and less in focus and I also wanted to create a lot of depth between them to convince the audience that there is space between them and the water and atmosphere. So I was very, very careful in how I would go about rendering and, and describing these figures. It was really challenging to figure out how dark the value was gonna be because if without it being dark enough, it didn't look convincingly underwater, but I was afraid if I made it too dark, then it wouldn't look like it was behind everything. Uh, it was just a very careful play between the values and the local colors of these individual creatures, wanting each of them to look distinct from each other, but not too distinct so that they are popping off too much from the scene because they are not the main focus. I would have to say the most challenging side was the left side with the whale in the back, like the big whale, and then the shark and the little whale at the front because there's a bit of a weird um, kind of optical illusion going on, I guess. The shark is behind the whale in the front, technically, but he is coming forward into the clamshell, which is in front of the whale in the front. It's a little confusing, but I hope you can see what I mean. It was just really challenging to convince that the shark was coming more towards us, you know, his head and his arms, but the body is behind the whale that's in front of him. It's challenging, but it is a fun problem-solving aspect of painting. Um, getting the background to look dark enough that it is convincingly an underwater scene was probably the most challenging part and you will see me towards the very end of the uh, painting that I will keep tweaking and darkening the background as I go. Maybe there are other ways to make it appear like an underwater piece without having to go so dark because in my head I didn't quite envision this piece to be quite as dark but I think it all worked out in the end and it is more convincing that it is nighttime. So as I've said before, um, I felt like this piece was stuck in ugly mode or the ugly stage for so long until I started putting in little details like the bubbles and the coral at the front. And suddenly I felt like I had a piece in my hands. This was no longer 
a struggle. It pulled through and came together at the end into a nice little piece. And if you're interested in owning a print of it, it is available on my online shop. Link will be down below. I had it closed for the longest time because I, you know, I got really busy the past few months and I knew I couldn't um, fulfill those orders while I was traveling and all that stuff. So it's finally back up and running. And I haven't decided yet at the time of this recording, but I might do a summer sale. So if I do do that, by the time this video is out, I will um, put down the promo code for the sale um, in the description below. So look out for that. And I guess that's it. I hope you guys enjoy listening to the trials and tribulations of the makings of this piece. I know I said I would update you guys on like where I've been and what I've been up to lately, but this video did run a bit longer than I thought I, it would. So. The most important bit of the update is that I am back now and despite my busy schedule, I will try to make videos here and there. So very happy to be back. And also I teased you guys about the very good news early on in this video. And the good news is that dun, 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 I am finally monetized, finally. That was a long time coming that took I don't know, um, since November, so one, two, uh, nine months? Well, okay, it turns out I was monetized sometime in June. I didn't know until recently because I just totally gave up on checking, you know, the past few months when it clearly wasn't gonna happen this year or ever for that matter, but it finally happened. If you guys are new to my channel, then you probably don't know the struggles I had with trying to get my um, channel monetized. Um, but you guys who have seen my older videos know that I had been eligible for monetization since November 2017 and I've been under approval since then. And I, first I was told, you know, oh, within a week, we'll get back to you. And then a few months passed with nothing. And then there was a note saying, oh, we'll get to the reviews by the end of January. Well, January passed and then there was a note saying that we'll get to it at the end of February and then April and then it was June. And then one day when I was in my creator studio, I noticed the dollar signs next to my videos. They didn't even email me that my channel had been monetized. So I didn't even know. Isn't that terrible? I think that's pretty terrible. I can't believe how long of a saga this has been to get my channel monetized that was eligible since November 2017. I know most of you are going to be thrilled for me. Um, I had a lot of you asking me like, oh, are you monetized yet? And I really appreciate that uh, because to me, it does mean a lot. I mean, I know I'm not making any money at this point, like especially because I stopped making videos for like a few months and my channel is not big enough to bring in any money yet, but it's a symbolic thing and it kind of is a positive incentive for me when I see that I'm working towards a goal. I can see the positive or negative impact of my videos and how they're received by the audience. It seems like such an important tool for gauging the health of your channel. Anyway, I am just thrilled and I honestly feel like I have like a weight off my shoulders that this thing is finally not an issue anymore. And I hope you guys are happy for me because this might mean that I, I may invest more time back into YouTube now which means more content for my channel and more videos for you guys. So I think it's welcome news for everyone. Yay! All right, I think this video has gone on long enough. I really hope you guys enjoyed seeing this painting come together and listening to me talk about the process. And I'm looking forward to my next YouTube video. So I will see you guys then. Bye!